as you are hopefully in the book of uh, Philemon, we're going to conclude a three-week mini-series through this tiny little book of Philemon, 25 verses. And as I hope you have seen over the course of the time that we've been in this book the last couple weeks, and I hope that you'll see today that this is a little book, but it's got huge lessons for when relationships go wrong. And I won't ask you to show your hands, but if I did, all of us would raise our hands that in one way or another, we have experienced some sort of a relationship fallout in one way or another. And that's what Philemon is actually all about. So I'll give you a real quick summary for several of you who maybe haven't been here for the whole series or whatever. If you have an ESV Bible, they have what is uh, in the very beginning of them, a little introduction of each of the books. It's really nice. And so here's what the ESV introduction says about this book of Philemon. It gives you a, a good idea of what's happening. It says Philemon is about reconciliation and relationships between Christians. So right there we say this is, this is important. Onesimus, that was one of the main characters, Onesimus, which means useful, was a, a slave or a bondservant of a believer named Philemon in Colossae. Apparently Onesimus had stolen from Philemon and fled. At some time, while Paul was under arrest, Onesimus met him and became a Christian. Paul apparently wrote this letter at the same time as Colossians and gave it to Onesimus to carry back to Philemon. Paul appealed to Philemon to accept Onesimus back into his household, but as a brother in the Lord rather than as a slave. In Paul's estimation, Onesimus was far more useful now that he was a Christian. Paul even promised to pay whatever debt Onesimus might owe Philemon. And so the idea of reconciliation of relationships between Christians is something that we can all, in one way or another, resonate with. And that's the topic of this small little book. And so uh, I'll put on the screen for you just because I think it's important for us to understand where we've been over the last couple of weeks. I want to make sure that, that we are kind of all on the same page because of the applicability of it. So in the first week of the series, we looked at verses 1 through 7, and that was really the approach. And what I tried to do there is to teach the right approach to ruin relationships. Did you know that there's a, a wrong approach to ruin relationships? Like when relationships go south, there are lots of wrong approaches. I could ask for examples today and probably get many, right? There are plenty of wrong approaches when relationships go bad. They usually start on social media. I'll just put that there and let you think about it, okay? If your first move when a relationship goes bad is to open up Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I would just say push pause, okay? There are plenty of wrong approaches, but what Paul does in this letter, and if you remember correctly, Philemon was the one who was wrong. Onesimus was the one who had done wrong, and Paul was the mediator trying to right the wrong. And what Paul does in these first few verses in Philemon is that he helps understand the right approach when relationships go bad, that include the right people and the right attitude and the right perspective and the right expectations. And so as we go into relationship reconciliation, the approach is important. So we looked at that the first week. Then last week, we saw the body of this little letter, verses 8 through 18, and we talked about the appeal. And Paul actually makes an appeal to Philemon to bring Onesimus back. And so we talked about five moves for making relationships right. I'm not going to go through all of those again. If you missed that sermon, uh, you can hear that online or watch it on uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, but some specific moves for making relationships right, and those moves are very practical things that we can all do. But sometimes we make the wrong moves in relationships, and we suffer the consequences of that. And so in the main body of the letter, Paul lays out some moves for making relationships go right. And so finally today, we'll, we'll look at the close of the letter. We'll look at the application to all of this. And I want us to look at this one big idea of what happens when reconciliation goes right. Because I think so many times, and we're talking about Christian relationships, so many times in Christian relationships or within the church context, reconciliation goes wrong. Reconciliation goes south and bad things happen. And so infrequently do we see it go right that we need to be reminded that it even can go right. I believe that the reason that we have this tiny little letter, 25 verses, in the original language there's roughly 350 words in this letter. And the reason why when we have books like Romans and Corinthians and Hebrews why would God give us this tiny little letter? Why would it be preserved? And I believe that this letter was given to Philemon by Onesimus. 
And as Onesimus stood in front of Philemon, and Philemon read this letter from Paul, that then Philemon did what Paul asked him to, and the relationship was restored, and good things happened. And I believe that that's why that we have this inscripturated, that it's part of Scripture for us, so that we can learn from this great example. So today in verses 19 through 25, I want us to ask and answer that question, like what happens when reconciliation goes right? And so if you have your Bibles, in verses 19 through 20, I'll put them on the screen for you today. In verses 19 and 20, we can see that when reconciliation goes right, first hearts are refreshed. Verse 18, verse 19, excuse me. Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. You might think that's interesting. Most of the time in those days, especially in Paul's condition, when, when someone wrote a letter to someone else, a scribe or an amanuensis was used, someone else who was writing it down. At this point in Paul's life, it's very possible and probable that he's actually handcuffed, physically handcuffed, and maybe he can't even write, or if he can, it's very difficult, and possibly had someone else transcribing this letter along with the letter Colossians. But at this point, he says, I need to take the pen, and I need to write this myself. Because this is personal. This is real. This is intimate. This is important. And for all of you who maybe get lots of emails every day and lots of media input every day, when someone writes you a letter and it's addressed in handwriting and you get it out of your mailbox and then you open it up and it's actual handwriting, usually, if it's someone that you know, it makes you think that person took the time and it took the energy and the effort to actually write a letter. They could have typed it. They could have used spell check. I might have been able to read it better had they typed it, right? Especially if you're getting a letter from me. But it shows something about the personal nature of that correspondence. My girls this week, uh, I went to the mailbox and I opened the mailbox and there were three letters in there. And you know, people don't get, get letters anymore, do they? So there were three in there and it was one to Maddie, one to Brooke, and one to Cece. I actually said Cece. And I looked at it, and it was all self-addressed and everything. And it was from their camp counselor from this summer. That was super cool, right? And so I held the letters at ransom. And I said, okay, look at this. Ah, we got some work to do at home. But they were super excited about the letter that they were going to get because they had a relationship with this counselor. They, this was their first year of resident camp this year. Josh Oswald spoke. Where's Heidi? Jo- Heidi's husband, Josh, spoke. Did a phenomenal job. Their first week of camp. So exciting. And they get this letter from their camp counselor, you know, a a couple months after they've been there. They were excited and they rip it open and they they take it and they read it and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. Sophie, I need to write her back. This is so great. Ah, right? But it meant something. It wasn't a form letter from the camp, dear camper, right? No, this was especially for each of them. And that camp counselor had a lot of kids this year. And the fact that she sat down and wrote the letter to each one of them. And it wasn't a form letter that she just kind of wrote down and was reading over here and writing down. Something different to each of them. There's something that she had remembered. That there was a heartfelt nature to what was being said and what was being written. And and that little line right there where Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand is meaningful in that day as a letter is meaningful in this day to say there's some heart behind what I'm saying to you. He says, then I will repay it you were with us last week in verse 18, Paul told Philemon that if, if Onesimus has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Paul says, I write this in my own hand, I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. By the way, remember that, that Paul had led not only Onesimus, but Philemon to the Lord as well. There was a spiritual debt that Philemon owed to Paul. Paul is reminding him of that. He says in, in the Verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. And that word benefit is an interesting word, too. If you have a note in your study Bible, you might see that that's actually a derivative. It's the, in the original language, it's the verbal form of Onesimus's name. So Paul says to Philemon, I'd really love to have some, <clears throat> remember that guy? some benefit. Remember that guy that you're supposed to bring back? I'd like to have some benefit in the Lord from that guy. And he says this, refresh my heart. In Christ. And if you've been paying attention, you realize that in verse 7, Philemon was known for refreshing the hearts of other people. You can look at that in verse 7. It says that he was known for being a person who refreshed the hearts of other people, that he was a solid Christian man. 
I think Dave Taylor could be remembered as a man who refreshed the hearts of other people. Dave was the custodian. Dave and Donna were the custodians here uh, when I first got here and had been the custodians for probably 25 years. And uh, at one point, I started, they retired, and then I started doing some of the cleaning here as well. And I remember we would have potlucks, and we would have the potluck, and Dave was retired, right? And I would be sitting there talking and hanging out with people, and I'd look over, and guess who's cleaning up? And I'd go, Dave, you're retired. You're going to get me fired. Knock it off. You can't keep cleaning, right? But Dave was this guy who just had this sweet heart and who was always helping and was always willing to serve. And we were talking about that as a family, even over this weekend. We all know those people who are the people who refresh our heart. You like to be around them. When they call you, you want to pick up that phone call. That was Philemon. So Philemon was known for refreshing the hearts of other people. And now in verse 20, he's supposed to refresh Paul's heart. How is he supposed to do that? By accepting and forgiving Onesimus. And remember, in verse 12, Paul said that Onesimus was his very heart. So there's this heartfelt forgiveness that's supposed to happen so that Paul is refreshed. And I want you to think about this, that any relational discord, any relational discord carries a heavy burden. It doesn't matter what kind of relational discord that is. When we have relational discord with other Christians, like that carries a heavy burden, and there's a cost to that. And what reconciliation is supposed to do is it's supposed to lift that burden. That if I'm fighting with one of you, or there's this underlying resentment or frustration or anger, you did something or said something or posted something, and I don't like it, and there's some some resentment or some anger or some hurt that's there, that that's like a weight, that's like a burden. And what reconciliation does is it lifts that burden off of you. And I realize that as we talk about this, and each week we've talked about this, that reconciliation means lots of things to lots of people. And I had a conversation even with someone just the other day and said, sometimes when we talk about reconciliation, it makes me cringe because of the things that I've gone through and the things that have been done to me. And I talked to that person. And I said, we don't make light of that in any way. Reconciliation isn't just brushing things under the rug, right? And for different levels of offense, there are different levels of things that need to happen for reconciliation to take place. This isn't just I love you and I forgive you and everything's fine and we're all good. I've said this each week that maybe it involves biblical counseling. Maybe it involves a third-party mediator. That there are lots of different things that that could mean. Because some of us have gone through intense hurt. And this reconciliation process means a lot. And it can be very difficult. But what I do know is that when there's not reconciliation, it's that there's always a burden. But that reconciliation is meant to lift that burden. And that's what Paul is talking about right here when he says, refresh my heart in Christ. I want some benefit from you. He's saying, I want my burden, my heart to be lifted because of this fight that's between the two of you. And it's it's impacting other people. And and the other thing that, that you can see here in this verse is that for Paul, this was a risky process, right? You can see he says, I write this in my own hand, I will repay it. So whatever it is that that Onesimus stole or took or whatever happened, Paul was going to take some of his own responsibility for other people's problems. You know, that's something that's difficult for many of us. Other people have problems, and we say, not my problem, your problem. But for those of us who at times have, have taken it upon ourselves in the proper way to involve ourselves in other people's problems, you know what? There's a price to pay for us there as well. One of the things that struck me as I read this and as I studied it and thought about it is that, that reconciliation is risky, but that the refreshment is worth the risk, right? Reconciliation is a risky business. You mean I'm going to go and talk to that person I don't like, or I'm going to at least have someone else talk to them, or we're going to do something to try to, to make this as right as we possibly can? That's a very risky process. But what Paul tells us here is that reconciliation is actually worth the risk. So if relational discord is like holding you down and is a burden in your life, I'm not suggesting that you run out and make a phone call to that person who hurt you, but I am suggesting that the possibility might be that we start to think about reconciliation and what that could possibly look like. That by even pursuing that in our own minds and our own hearts, that there are hearts that could be refreshed. And I may may never even walk alongside that person again. But 
there may be some level of refreshment that could happen because we're willing to risk the process. So Paul says when reconciliation goes right, hearts are refreshed. The next thing that we see in verses 21 and 22 is then that expectations are exceeded. Verse 21, Paul says, confident of your obedience. There's a couple ways you could take that, by the way. Confident of your obedience, okay, parents? When you say to your kid, no, I'm confident you're going to obey me. What does that mean? I'm confident you're going to obey me or else, right? So something Paul saying, now confident of your obedience, like I'm, you're going to obey me, all right, or else. Others believe that Philemon, all we know of Philemon is that Philemon was a good, godly, Christian man who loved the Lord, who was known throughout his community for refreshing the hearts of other people. And Paul's confidence came from Philemon's character. I tend to lean in that direction a little bit, that Paul's confidence came from Philemon's character, that that's, that's who he was. And so he says, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. You're going to exceed expectations. And then he has this interesting verse, verse 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. For I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Now that's really weird if you're reading it. Paul says, I'm confident of your obedience and that you're going to do even more than I ask. No, by the way, I'm coming over. Right? So, so I got to thinking about that this week. How many of you would just love to have Paul stay at your house? Let me see your hands. Come on, this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about, okay? There's like Jesus, and then there's Paul. I'm going to remind you of that, okay? We're not talking about Judas, we're talking about Jesus, and then there's Paul. We're talking about number two. I would love to have Paul stay at my house. I got a guest room, I'd make it ready, right? I'd get out a King James Bible and put it there on the nightstand, because that's what Paul read, apparently. It would be exciting. We would talk, we would talk theology, right? I'd say, Paul, why are you an amillennialist? And I'm not. And you talk about that. I'm just kidding about that. Sorry for both of you that got that joke. Okay, good. Right. You know, but having Paul there, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that Paul wrote that I don't get. And I'd love to take Romans 9 through 11 and say, okay, like, help me out here. Right? Romans 7, like, pre-Christian or I'm a Christian and I'm wrestling with it. Help me out, Paul. What did you mean here? I'd love to have Paul stay at my house, but not if he just wrote me this letter. Right? So if Paul wrote you and he said, hey, this guy's coming back. You need to forgive him. I know it's going to be hard. He did you dirty and it's not cool, but he's coming back and I need you to like really make sure that you take care of him. And oh, by the way, I'm going to be there to see if it happened. So now are you signing up for that? Yeah, Paul, come on over. You can stay with the Cleavers, right? Yeah, that's what he says. And he said, Paul, Paul says in this, and I, I think there's some irony and maybe a little bit of humor. He says, by the way, I'm coming over. One of my coaches in uh, in college, someone like my college soccer coach, had this phrase that he would use. And Coach Jacobs would always would use this phrase, greater expectations for us. And so I went to Bible college, but most of the schools that we played against in college were not Christian, you know, non-Christian schools. And so the non-Christian guys would act as non-Christians do on a soccer field or anywhere else for that matter when they're in college. And we as Christian guys, you know, would, there, there was a persona that we would have. And one of the things that drove my coach nuts is that there was this persona that, that the Christian guys were softies. And he hated that. And he did not want us to be soft. So he would say, you knock them down! And then you help them back up. Right? But don't help them back up if you didn't knock them down. And I love that about Coach Jay because he would be, you know, he, was, he didn't want us to be seen as soft. But let me tell you something. You say a swear word on the soccer field, Oh, don't let him hear it, right? You're on the bench. You're running laps. You're going somewhere. Yell at the referee, which I was a, I was a professional at that in high school, actually, yelling at the referee. So I get to Bible college, and, I, you know, something happens, and I start going off on the ref, and the next thing I'm yelling at the ref, the coach is yelling at me and yanking me off the field, and it's not pretty, right? But coach would always talk to us about greater expectation. And he would say, guys, we're going out there as a soccer team, and we've got this jersey on. And the jersey says Baptist Bible College right here. And he said, there's a, when you put on that jersey, there's a greater expectation for you. That when you go out on that field and you play, if you're soft and easy and, and a wimp and a wuss, his word, not mine, if that's you, that's not a good testimony. But if you look just like everybody else that's on the field and you speak the same way they do and treat the officials the same way that they do and treat each other the same way, 
that's not the same. That's not right either. He said, when you put on that jersey, there's a greater expectation. And he would challenge us to live by that greater expectation. What Paul is doing with Philemon right here is that he is setting a greater expectation. He's saying, I am confident based on who you are that you will do the hard thing, that you will not take the path of least resistance, that you will not do what everyone else would do, but that you will do the difficult thing. Paul is acknowledging, I know I'm asking you to do something relationally difficult. He's saying, but there's a greater expectation. And he's saying, based on your character, I know that you will exceed that expectation. And you've probably heard people talk about inspecting what we expect. And when Paul says that he's going to hopefully come and be there, I think in some ways he's saying, I'm going to be there and have the opportunity to inspect what I expect. He's not coming as a parent saying, I'm going to check up on you. But he's saying, when I show up at your house and I stay there and you're there and Onesimus is there and you guys are working together and you followed what you've called me to do, it's going to refresh my heart because you've exceeded expectations. Each of us have that opportunity. Each of us have the opportunity to refresh people's hearts by exceeding those expectations, doing hard things. And it's difficult. But that's what Paul is laying out. And when reconciliation goes right, we have that opportunity. Number three, in verses 23 and 24, partnerships are strengthened. And I need you to stay with me on this because usually what happens is we get to the end of like the meaty part of these New Testament letters. And then we get a list of names. And you know what you do because I know what I do. We just kind of blow by those, don't we? I can't pronounce them anyway, so I might as well not read them, right? And we blow by him and, and we miss something. So verse 22 says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in, the, in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And you and I would blow right on by that, not even think at all about it. But if you're reading your Bible and you have something called a Bible dictionary, you would look up each of these names, Right? And a Bible dictionary is not a hard tool to find. You can find them free online. But you would look up each of these names, and it would start to unlock some keys to this text for you, and there's something really cool going on. So Epaphras. Epaphras is an interesting guy. We don't hear a lot about most of these guys in other places in Scripture, but Epaphras, we hear a few things. Epaphras was actually a pastor of the church in Colossae. Who else was from Colossae? Philemon. Do you know the relationship that I have with Pastor Lauren, who's on vacation if you're visiting with us? But Pastor Lauren and I work together here at this church. He preaches sometimes, I preach other times. Every Monday we get together and we talk about ministry, we talk about you, we talk about the things that need to be, not, not in a bad way, we don't talk about you in a bad Well, not most of you, but anyway, <laughs> right? But we have a, a close personal relationship with each other. If you think about the relationship between myself and Pastor Lauren, that's Philemon and Epaphras. Because it is possible that Epaphras was the pastor at the church that met in Philemon's home. If not, he was at least another pastor in this relatively small town called Colossae. These men were close with each other. They had a close relationship with each other. And just like Pastor Lauren is gone today, on the day that this letter was written, Epaphras was gone. He was with Paul. He had gone on a journey with Paul. But although he was absent and he was with Paul, he was still present in heart. And there was relationship between Philemon and Epaphras. And I need you to know that. I need you to see that and understand that relationship. In addition, he talks about, he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. And then he, he names this guy by the name of Mark. Maybe you have heard of Mark before since there's a book of the Bible that he wrote. So John Mark, if you're not familiar with John Mark, John Mark was a ministry helper of Paul and Barnabas, especially on the first missionary journey. And you probably remember that as the missionaries wanted to go forward, that there was one point in time where John Mark decided to turn back and to leave. And this caused great dissension in the missionary team to the point which Paul and Barnabas, who were great missionary partners, actually split because of John Mark. And Paul did not want to take John Mark with them anymore. And Barnabas wanted to take him. And they got into such a heated argument and a fight, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, in such a fight, that they split and go their separate ways over John Mark. But here Paul is writing about John Mark. 
and saying that John Mark, that Mark is sending his greetings. And what we know from a later text of scripture that I'll read actually in a moment is that that is actually one of the greatest examples in scripture of relational reconciliation. That Mark was actually restored to the missionary community and to the Christian community. And Paul will say he's become very useful to me. And so in this bigger story of reconciliation, one of the people that Paul reminds Philemon of is another person who has experienced that reconciliation. And so you see that there's context that's actually being built. He talks about someone called Aristarchus. Aristarchus was another man who traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys. And, and actually, when they were in the major city of Ephesus, Paul caused such a disturbance that there was a riot, a huge riot. It says the whole city came out to see this riot. Some of them were rioting, and they didn't even know why they were rioting. It says, sounds like Seattle, right? And they were just rioting. And it says that they grabbed Aristarchus and some other people and just dragged them. It was like, oh, hey, there's some guys we can grab. Grab them and drag them into the theater. And they just dragged them into the theater. And there was Aristarchus. We also know that he was with Paul on Paul's fateful journey to Rome. This was a close ministry partner of the Apostle Paul. There's a man named Demas that is spoken of next. And here he's spoken of in a positive light as well as in Colossians. But in 2 Timothy, Demas is actually probably one of the more sad stories of Paul's companions because Demas was Paul's version of Jesus' Judas. The text says that Demas, having loved the present world, deserted Paul. Much like Judas deserted Jesus, Demas deserted Paul. The final person that is listed here is Luke. Many of you know that Luke wrote the book of Luke and Acts. He's responsible for more content of our New Testament than any other writer, including Paul. But if you take the Gospel of Luke and Acts, there's more content there than any other single writer in the New Testament. And Paul, or Luke was a traveling companion. He was a ministry partner. And one of the coolest things about Luke is if you turn to, or I can turn there, Second uh, Timothy, says this, turn the right direction a little bit. 2 Timothy 4, it says, do your best to come to me soon for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica, Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Verse 11, Luke alone is with me. This is probably the last correspondence that Paul ever wrote and who's with him, standing by his side as he awaits execution, probably awaits execution is Luke, his physician, his attendant. Luke alone is with me. And then he says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. And even in that, there's this beautiful picture of the ministry team. And so what I want you to see is when we read a few names in verses 23 and 24, these aren't just a random list of names. This is a list of, of the band of brothers of which Philemon was a part. So if you had on the stage myself, and you had Pastor Lauren was here, and if you had Forrest Bushing, who was one of our elders who was up here, and I could even say today Steve Cleaver, who I served with at University Place as one of the elders, and he was here, and we had one of or two of our deacons who were up here, and we were all here together, and I thought about bringing all of those guys up on stage, I'll refrain, but I want you to use that picture in your mind, that there are several of these men here together. And someone was imploring me, to do something scriptural, to do something godly. And it had the backing of all of the names of those men. And it said, and Steve Cleaver sends his greeting, and Pastor Lauren sends his greeting, Andy Clare sends his greeting. And you know what he's doing? He's setting positive peer pressure there, that as Philemon read those words, he would have understood that all of those men meant something to him. That was part of his band of brothers, and there was accountability in that. For us as men especially, we love to be part of a team that's doing something, a team that's moving something forward, that's building something. And sometimes in order for the team to be strengthened, reconciliation has to happen. Have you ever been involved in that situation at work where relationships are under fire and under pressure? Have you ever been involved in that situation on a team where relationships aren't going well? Everything is affected, isn't it? when the relationships aren't going well. But when reconciliation goes right, all of those partnerships are strengthened. And what would have happened is Philemon read that letter and he obeyed what Paul did and he exceeded those expectations that at the end of the day, 
all of those men would have been strengthened by his example. And when they were able to get back together and see each other and spend more time together, and Onesimus was there, and Philemon was there, and reconciliation had gone right, there would have been great strength. They would have been strengthened together because they were able to call him out, and he was able to do what they asked, and they made it through it. And they worked through it together. So those partnerships were strengthened. And finally, Paul ends his letter with that last verse. And like the previous two verses, sometimes we hear this phrase in Paul's letters and we just blow right on by it. But verse 25 is going to say that when reconciliation goes right, grace is exemplified. That's the fourth and final point. And verse 25 says this. It just simply says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. We hear something akin to that in most of Paul's letters. And just like the hello at the beginning of the letter, sometimes we think, oh, that's just a fancy spiritual way of saying goodbye. Right? But there's so much more to it than that. Grace. We have as Christians different ways of explaining God's grace. I think someone said grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Right? Or God's righteousness at Christ's expense. We often tell people that, that mercy is not getting what I do deserve and that grace is getting what I don't deserve, right? If grace is getting what I don't deserve, what was Paul asking Philemon to exhibit to Onesimus? He was asking him to give him something that he didn't deserve. He was saying, I know this person hurt you. I know this person did what was not right when he's become a Christian. This is a big part of our application of, of how this reconciliation worked. Onesimus was not a Christian when, when he hurt Philemon. He became a Christian. And not only that, but I believe that he was a repentant Christian and he wanted to go back. There's a lot that's there that's important. But Paul was asking Philemon to show grace to Onesimus. And as he asks that, he reminds him of the grace that's been extended to him. When he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. We have to understand that we will never exhibit God's grace until we've experienced God's grace. We'll never exhibit God's grace to other people. We'll never be godly, gracious people. We may be gracious people, but we'll never be godly, gracious people and exhibit God's grace until we've experienced the grace of God. Because you see, whatever the debt is that's owed to me by someone else, it gets put into great perspective when I understand the debt that I owe, that my sin creates this unpayable debt between me and God, and that the only way for that debt to be paid was through Jesus Christ. And we've said all along that this book of Philemon, as we close this message and as I close this series, that this book of Philemon is a beautiful example of horizontal reconciliation, reconciliation between people that it's a beautiful example, that we can learn some principles about reconciling relationships between us. And in that way, it's a good example. But even more than that, it's a beautiful illustration of vertical reconciliation. The reconciliation that needs to take place between me and God. And I've said it every week, that Philemon in the illustration would be God. And that Philemon is the one who's been wronged against. And Onesimus would be you and would be me, that we are the ones who ran that we are the ones who did the wrong. And that Paul is the, the picture of Christ in the illustration. And that Paul is the mediator and the one who's righting the wrong. Onesimus couldn't write his own wrong. But Paul helps him and writes that wrong. We will never exhibit God's grace to other people until we understand the debt that we owe to God and understand the grace that has been exhibited to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe that that's the greater story of Philemon. And so when reconciliation goes right, it's a difficult process. And when reconciliation goes right for you, it may be something as simple as a phone call and an apology. Or it may be something as deep and as difficult as counseling and mediation and other people stepping in and helping out and all of those things. But what I do know is that when reconciliation goes right, these things happen. The things that are on the screen happen, and ultimately, God is honored. God is glorified. So as we end this series this morning, I'm going to put a list of questions up on the screen. You can feel free to take a picture if you'd like. 
These are not for you necessarily to work through right now, but they're for you to think through later. I'm just going to leave them up there even as we end the services and we get ready to leave. So if you want to come up and take a picture later, you can. What I did is I tried to just ask some questions that relate to this entire series. The first is the most important. Have you been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus? It doesn't happen any other way. Scripture is very clear that there's no other way towards salvation. For by grace, you have been saved through faith in Jesus. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that we don't have any reason to boast and say, look what I did. Have you been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus? If you haven't, if you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, today's your day to do that. You don't need me to do that. You don't need an elder to do that. You don't need anyone else other than just you humbling yourself before God and admitting you're a sinner, believing in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection as a payment for your sin and confessing him as your Savior and Lord. You become a Christian. You're reconciled to God. That relationship is right. And once that vertical relationship is right, then you can work on the reconciliation that needs to happen around you. And you can ask some of those other questions that are there. What relationships need to be made right in small ways or in big ways? What might the right approach look like? Who else do I need to get involved? What kind of prayers do I need to start out with? How is that going to happen? What of those different moves, relational moves need to be made? What are going to be the results if that reconciliation goes right? And think about that. What, what, are, what are the results? Is this burden going to be lifted for me? Or am I at least going to be able to sleep better at night? Or how is that going to work? And then the last question then is, is what stops me? Because we all have something, don't we? 